Okay, we are now live. Welcome everyone to Quick to Politic. Um, my name is Ernestine Lyons and I am a um, political advocate and I'm also a councilwoman in the city of Harper Woods. Um, and during, that's my, uh, I have wear multiple hats and I also, um, you know, work for a small business incubator. Um, and we're all about, you know, making sure that everybody is, um, you know, that, that small businesses are heard. Um, but I'm also, um, I started Quick to Politic um, and I'm your host um, because I really wanted to, you know, have a discourse, discourse a discussion on what it means to, to just rebuild and what it means to, you know, to have a discussion around how we, we get to solutions for, you know, political problems and, you know, just interviewing great minds. So today, uh, here with me is um, Saeed Khan, and um, he is a um, lecturer with the Department of Near Eastern and Asian Studies, uh, which has now changed its name at Wayne State University. Um, uh, it's now under Classical Modern Languages and Literatures. Or, um, and he's also an adjunct professor uh, in Islamic Studies at the University of Detroit Mercy and Rochester College. So um, his focus is on US, pol uh, US policy, globalization, the Middle East, uh, Islamic studies, as well as um, genomics and um, bioethics. So um, Mr. Khan, uh, my former professor, um, was also um, has been a contributor with uh, several media agencies such as C-SPAN, NPR, uh, the BBC, Voice of America, um, and uh, the CBC as well. Um, and are you still a co-host of um, Detroit Today? No, uh, that's actually changed. First of all, thank you for having me on. Uh, you can call me Saeed. I think uh, we can dispense with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the formalities of a professor. Um, you, you've graduated. Um, uh, Detroit Today is actually now uh, hosted by Stephen Henderson. So that's a little bit in my rearview mirror. Uh, but I do host a podcast called uh, 1400 OMG. Uh, by way of the Toledo Society, which is uh, making sense of what the hell happened in Muslim history. So uh, I decided to uh, jump into the uh, the field of uh, podcasting as well, and uh, it's uh, it's quite fun. Awesome, awesome. And it's funny because um, I um, I mentioned earlier before we went live that I'm a part of the Michigan Political Leadership Fellowship, where one of the fellows, um, Bilal Hamoud, um, turns out that he also had you as a guest on uh, a podcast that he has. And from there, you know, he just mentioned that you were really into um, AI, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning and just, you know, um, some, some of these things that as I feel like you were one of, one of, always one of my favorite lecturers. So I feel like I knew so much about you. Just like, yes, so you come from the BBC and, <laughs> you know, um, always going, you know, Globe trotting to London and, uh, you know, being a correspondent and, and kind of giving your opinion on so many different issues. I'm just like, well, that's news to me. So, um, you know, it, it just kind of brought me to thinking, um, will the pandemic change the direction of artificial intelligence and machine learning? And, you know, will this kind of ramp up this sort of need to, all right, we're going to have to automate a lot because, you right. know, this, this whole pandemic has thrown a wrench into a lot of things. So yeah. what do you think is the future? Well, so since you've left campus, a uh, couple of uh, promotions, I'm now senior lecturer in Near East and Asian Studies, and I'm also director of Global Studies. Uh, which is a brand new um, uh, department uh, within the classical modern languages, literatures, and cultures. And uh, as a result, uh, I like to see, and you mentioned the word incubator, I like to see global studies as, a, as an incubator by which uh, you can interact with so many different disciplines, so many fields, so many departments, uh, not only on campus, but also more broadly with uh, the Metro Detroit area, with businesses, with, with uh, political concerns, and then even, of course, because of the title, globally, uh, and recognize how all of these things fit in. That's why I'm really fascinated by uh, artificial intelligence, because it seems like that's going to be the next big thing. And it already is here. It is uh, something that uh, affects us uh, every day in different manifestations. We use it. Uh, and in fact, in many ways, uh, the question isn't, um, if we're going to use it, but to what extent we're becoming dependent on it. And so you have on the one hand, AI, as you said, machine learning, machine intelligence, 
uh, and how uh, that then plays a role when it comes to our devices, our interaction. Uh, in many ways, this pandemic would have taken on a completely different dimension uh, if we didn't have, for example, Zoom and some of the other uh, platforms uh, by which we can communicate. Uh, it certainly made the, um, uh, the, the shock of the pandemic a little bit easier to manage on campus by moving uh, campus virtually. And it's something that may be with us uh, for the fall term as well. Uh, as this thing plays out. Uh, but your question regarding how do we then see the pandemic uh, affecting our relationship with AI? Well, there's a few different ways that we can look at this. Number one is there are several apps and there are several uh, um, utilities that AI is providing for researchers, for epidemiologists, uh, for policymakers, uh, contact tracing, uh, which is trying to then uh, determine uh, the flow of infection and transmission uh, within populations, how it is then uh, moving uh, within communities, within countries, or even overseas. That is a very helpful thing. Of course, the other side of that uh, discussion is that the, uh, the apps that would be required uh, are ones that require surveillance, and of course, anytime you're talking about surveillance, you're talking about not only the source of the surveillance, whether it is the government or whether it is private enterprises, how trustworthy are these things? How much are we willing to, in the name of uh, uh, security or in the name of uh, protecting ourselves from a pandemic, are we willing to give up uh, a certain amount of our privacy? Uh, is that going to be irreversible? I mean, once the technology is there, uh, will anybody ever want, um, want to go ahead and uh, uh, so-called put it back in the box? Uh, yeah, what sort of biases are behind, you know, just, just what decisions are being made about who's surveilled and why we watch them? Exactly. So you have that dimension of uh, artificial intelligence. You also, of course, uh, have to contend with the fact that artificial intelligence may de develop its own self-awareness, self-consciousness. Uh, and that, again, is a very open question as to where that'll lead. And then, of course, you've got the um, element of artificial intelligence when it comes to automation and the ability to then substitute for uh, human agency, for human capital. Now, on the one hand, of course, that's going to be very helpful uh, when it comes to our economic output, uh, the fact that if productivity can still continue thanks to automation, that's a wonderful thing. But then, of course, let's say the pandemic is over, uh, will people want to go back, or maybe not so much people, but will corporations and others want to revert back to dealing with human beings in, involved instead of the automation? Uh, if the automation is seen to be uh, much more uh, efficient, much more effective than human beings, what does that then mean for the labor force? And we've already seen examples of this when it comes to the automation of industry. Uh, the United States is already uh, a shadow of what it once was when it came to manufacturing. Uh, that has moved to other countries, uh, China, uh, Vietnam, Turkey, uh, for example. And as a result of it, the notion then of uh, resurrecting manufacturing uh, is always going to be elusive here in the United States when uh, the appeal of technology is so great. You have technology, you don't have to worry about liability for human beings. Uh, robots don't ask for pensions. They don't ask for uh, wage increases. And so there's always going to be that need for uh, developing a balance, developing an equilibrium. Uh, and I think COVID-19 is yet another example, as you said before, uh, for us to have a real deep uh, uh, reassessment of uh, how we are uh, when it comes to humanity, uh, where we are uh, as to priorities. Uh, certainly one of the uh, consequences of COVID is a, uh, a very identifiable reduction in pollution around the world. Uh, if anything, it's seen as almost a, a minor reset uh, for the environment. Uh, to uh, at least, uh, pardon the pun, breathe a sigh of relief, because it can breathe now without those pollutants there. And so the question then remains, is this something that people may uh, look to as uh, perhaps periodically 
something if it is controllable uh, every so many years, allowing the earth to uh, recalibrate itself? Uh, th these are profound questions uh, that we have to consider. Thank you, thank you for that because you actually brought up a few points. Um, you know, this, this, the whole thing. It, we're we're wanting to have these discussions on, like, to have a reassessment, um, a, dis a reassessment, and you know, disruptive innovation in politics, and to use that, you know, kind of buzzword of disruptive innovation. You know, because in some ways we really have to be a little bit more radical because the economy is, you know, going to shift dramatically, um, for better or for worse. But um, that kind of leads me to, you know, on the, uh, you know, talking about AI and technology and will there be monumental shifts in the way, for example, more people will be reliant on, say, the gig economy or what will that look like as, you know, AI begins to have maybe autonomous driving vehicles and you you know you you have a whole shift in the way that people use transportation or you know just sort of gig things that are that can now be mechanized or automated and you know what does that mean for me as a millennial where you know I know I'm you know very blessed to be in a position where um I, I work a job where I don't need to necessarily be a part of the gig economy, but and it's not necessarily even a bad thing. But you know, I know people that do um, you know consulting work and things that that's a part of the gig economy as well. So right. where do you say see that um, you know any of this will, will really make any monumental shifts in you know just how that economy is going to continue to operate um, or how it will you know change for the better or for the worse. So on the one hand, I think you're right when you use a term like uh, disruptive innovation. Uh, at the same time, we always have to temper that with disruptive regression. Uh, is there then the possibility that, uh, for example, the innovations of Twitter uh, can then be used uh, in a way that uh, brings out uh, some of the more base emotions, impulses, and uh, and prejudices of, 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 of people? And I think we uh, certainly see plenty of examples of that, unfortunately. Uh, the gig economy is, uh, is, is something fascinating because, uh, again, it seems as though it's very much located uh, within a particular generational uh, uh, area and context. Um, and you're seeing already consequences of, uh, of the gig economy uh, and uh, how it is being impacted by the paralysis that uh, COVID has caused around the world. If, for example, your gig economy was based on uh, uh, travel, uh, that is no longer an option in the near future. And so on the one hand, if uh, what uh, is being achieved in the gig economy is something that can then easily or readily uh, be transferred uh, into the virtual, then there seems to be some uh, uh, promise for uh, that particular individual uh, to be able to sustain him or herself. Uh, otherwise, uh, simply bouncing off the atmosphere of the earth, uh, to use a metaphor, may, uh, may require some rethinking. At the same time, that means that uh, for someone who is trying to come out of the gig economy, which of course br brings with it a certain level of dynamism, a certain level of variety, uh, a certain level of uh, of autonomy, uh, they may have to seek at least uh, in part a home base which provides some level of stability and structure. Now, having said that, what we're finding with COVID is that even those kinds of structures which one thought may be permanent, uh, ones that were uh, impervious to uh, any kind of significant or seismic shift, that doesn't exist either. If you take a look, for example, at higher education universities, there are plenty of stories of some universities that at the very least are having to consider budget cuts. Uh, they may even be considering salary freezes, salary cuts, uh, hiring freezes, hiring cuts, uh, layoffs, uh, as well as even downsizing entire departments. Uh, some uh, universities are looking at this as being an existential threat uh, to their viability. Uh, what's interesting is uh, reading a recent uh, uh, article on this, uh, the college town, which was always seen to be uh, this, uh, this very stable uh, 
uh, economic model because uh, students were always going to come into a place like, say, Ann Arbor or East Lansing. Uh, those now are places that are having to seriously question what is going to be their viability. Uh, on the one hand, it would seem everybody needs to eat, but apparently no, uh, not everyone needs to go to a restaurant in order to achieve that. Exactly. That's going to be a cultural shift. Uh, we take it for granted to actually go someplace out of the house and eat in public with strangers. Uh, if you think about going to a restaurant, that's, that's really what it's about. That may have to be reassessed. Whereas uh, a campus like Wayne State, for example, which is still predominantly a commuter campus, may ironically enough be able to um, uh, have that shock absorber more effectively than say a place like Ann Arbor because it is not as reliant when it comes to its budget on students being on campus with, uh, with campus housing and all of the infrastructure that goes with that. Uh, there's a lot that we have to go ahead and unpack. It used to be said that the two towns that never really have to worry about their economy are college towns and places where there are prisons. Uh, and maybe it seems as though the latter is going to be the one that survives uh, more easily than the college town. So these are all incredibly uh, important and profound questions that have to be dominant, uh, uh, one could argue, when it comes to the public discourse of, as you said, I mean, we're going to get through the pandemic. It's like we're in a wormhole. What's on the other side of the wormhole? We're still unsure. But this is the time when we actually have, interestingly enough, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to really ask those serious questions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, doing so is within this broader static of the political and the partisan uh, when it comes to uh, the pandemic. And that's what makes it really dangerous because it's such a distraction. It is. And, and I think it's, it's a distraction that it doesn't necessarily have to be. And I think one of my questions later is going to point to some of these issues we have about why the United States seems to be, you know, singular in some of this, this backlash and sort of, um, you mentioned dis, um, you know, uh, disruptive regression, um, where, you know, it kind of brings to mind the fact that during 9-11, we were all able to come together because there was a disaster. There was, you know, something akin to a pandemic where you had a, a, an attack on your, your country. It's not on the same scale, but at the same time, it's something that rallies, it rallied the country together at the time. You know, no matter what people thought about George W. Bush, they rallied around him and everybody, you know, his approval rating was through the roof. Everybody thought he was doing a good job. Rudy Giuliani was America's mayor and people were willing to give up civil liberties, you know, taking off their shoes when they go through TSA. And, you know, so we were willing to make sacrifices then, no matter what your political affiliation. And now it just seems that when there's something that's a little bit more, you know, impactful, like a, a pandemic, it won't discriminate. It won't just be localized. It won't just be this area might have an attack this day. You know, it's, it's unpredictable. So why is it so politicized and why do we, why are we so polarized right now where you have people protesting um, and going and just kind of going to their, 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 their state government and, you know, for example, here, the protests in Lansing where people had, you know, AK-47s and AR-15s. Why do we need to have this? Um, it's, it's, you know, I, I, this was a question that I had for one of my earlier guests on Quick to Politic. Um, you know, um, a congressional candidate uh, running against Alyssa Slotkin um, and, he, you know, uh, Mike Dittmer. So he, I, he, he led the protest. He led the protest to Lansing, one of the early ones, and then they had another uh, freedom rally. And I just really wanted to know, you know, why Michigan? Why protest? And what would you do differently if you were governor? So it, it just kind of makes me think that, is this really why has it become so politicized one and is it really that polarizing of a thing and two like what is it that's making this different than any other response that we've had that made us rally together well i mean in the 20 um, close to 20 years since 9 11 uh the, the political culture of the country has changed dramatically uh, some would argue that uh, the advent of social media, which occurred uh, after 9-11, uh, 
has dramatically um, and irrevocably changed that uh, that landscape. If uh, social media was around the way that it is now during 9-11, I mean, can one only imagine uh, the, the way that uh, conversations uh, would occur? Uh, it would, of course, be hopeful that uh, uh, people would, as you said, be more united, recognize that uh, the country needed to come together. Uh, it was a time when there was no uh, tolerance for anybody who was going to be divisive. And at the same time, it was that uh, compulsion toward a unified front uh, that was also exploited. It allowed for the USA Patriot Act, as you said, I mean, things which would curb civil liberties uh, to pass without, uh, by the admission of most Congress people, without having read the bill at all. And there was a tremendous fear that anyone who would raise his or her hand, uh, even to make an inquiry about the propriety of this, was going to have his or her patriotism challenged. Uh, that's where the country was at that point, and uh, people recognized that there were bigger platitudes to consider than, uh, than even uh, a, a, a robust discussion on, on civil liberties. I mean, Fast forward. I wonder, well, well, why? Well, I, I don't want to cut you off, but it's like, why, you know, are you not wanting to question your, your you know, patriotism now? Well, part of it, I think, uh, to be quite honest, is that most people who uh, were uh, looking at this as a possible infringement of civil liberties weren't concerned about their own civil liberties being infringed. Uh, there was, uh, it seemed, at least an implicit sense that uh, the USA Patriot Act was uh, directed toward terrorists, uh, and by terrorists, uh, those who fit a certain kind of racial and religious profile. Those who did not fit that bill had nothing to worry about because they were beyond any level of suspicion or scrutiny. And so it only became alarming when the proverbial little old silver haired lady uh, was being asked to take off her shoes uh, in a quote unquote random search uh, when uh, there may have been some swarthy uh, Middle Eastern looking men uh, who were not. So that's how uh, both the culture and the politics of the time started to creep into this notion of divisiveness. And then, of course, um, 2008 was a landmark moment in, in American history with the election of the first African-American president. But there's been so many cultural shifts that have occurred in the U.S., in the last uh, few years. The 2015 Obergefell versus Hodges case uh, where the Supreme Court held that uh, same-sex marriage was now constitutional. That sent a shockwave through many in the country who felt that uh, what they had perceived to be essential and eternal America and American identity was now uh, starting to dissipate. And remember, we're moving toward within probably 20 years uh, a real significant shift when it comes to America becoming a, major, a majority minority country. So when we see some of these uh, elements uh, which reek of nativism, racism, uh, uh, bigotry, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia, uh, and the such, these are all manifestations of a kind of moral panic uh, that has uh, now not only start to set in, uh, but it is also being exploited for uh, both political and for economic gain. So it's not very difficult for uh, to, to then see how some will lead these protests uh, because there are willing um, uh, audiences for that. I mean, this is really all about market share, unfortunately. And uh, uh, the country is, uh, as, as you know by reading the polls, practically split down the middle. And that has now also affected our nomenclature. Uh, we talk about one another as being red or blue. Uh, this is no longer Compton. This is not the Bloods and the Crips. This is the entire country being divided along uh, political color lines. Uh, and the impunity by which one side can be completely dismissive of the other, even if it is that that particular state or political entity uh, wins by one vote. It's a winner-take-all mentality. 
And so this idea then that 49.9% uh, of a constituency just doesn't matter anymore uh, seems to really run afoul of what American civics were really about. But I think it helps explain then that as we move into the pandemic, think about the binaries that are being created. Um, the fact that the mask now has become politicized. Those who don't wear it are seen as being free. Uh, and that is in their mind, the uh, expression of patriotism. And then those who are wearing the mask, even out of safety and concern for someone else's safety, uh, are seen as politically correct. Uh, that kind of uh, branding, that kind of framing uh, is, is really unprecedented when it comes to uh, a national health crisis that we find here. And, and uh, with few exceptions, uh, the rest of the world uh, is, is not like that. Of course, you do have places like India where the pandemic is being politicized. Uh, but I would argue, as with the United States, it simply uh, exposes underlying divisions which were being exploited and the pandemic allows an opportunity for it to uh, be exploited even further. Right, right. That's, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, you, you were right about how um, social media kind of created a whole different, you know, way in which you can frame and, you know, kind of, um, you know, just, just put out misinformation. And, you know, we, we didn't necessarily have that, um, you know, um, social media was in its like nascence at that point. And, you know, now it's, it's where I even remember you know, around that time, you didn't even have the, you know, the cable news pundits, they weren't as, you know, politicized, and it wasn't as biased. You, if you were watching CNN, it was just reporting that was balanced. And, you know, it, it, it didn't necessarily reek of one particular uh, perspective or another. And so I think um, it, 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 it really does point to a sort of a, a, a decided change in just the, the way that the country started, you know, interacting with how how the media kind of frames conversations. Well, there were two things. There were two things there. One is again the idea that uh, the media is uh, has its own biases, uh, has its own perspectives, which has always been the case. Uh, but remember, there's a there there was at least in principle a profound difference between uh, the, the reportage of the New York Times and the editorial page, the reportage of the Wall Street Journal and the editorial page. Now it seems as though uh, people aren't able to discern the distinction between, say, a story on page one by Maggie Haberman uh, or an op-ed that, uh, that is um, uh, published either by the editorial board or by a contributing writer. That's pretty dangerous. The other is uh, the erosion of uh, acceptance and the presumption of authority for uh, experts. Uh, you mentioned the word punditry. Uh, once upon a time, there would be people who would come on uh, who were recognized experts in the field. They had put in the hard work. Uh, social media and the internet writ large has, um, and I'll use this word because I, I don't know if there's a better word to describe it, has democratized knowledge or access to knowledge or what is seen as the authority of knowledge. So one person who clickbaits a couple of articles on BuzzFeed and Reddit is now given equal weight uh, to somebody who spent years uh, working within a particular discipline. For example, and, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's been, you know, for 30 years, the leading infectious disease expert, you know, through several presidencies. But then, you know, you're also weighing what he has to say up against someone like Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz. And, you know, it just kind of has that sort of dichotomy. And I think we've kind of entered into an age where Oh, well, so what he said that, so what he's got all these, you know, years of research, you know, who cares? He's just an egghead. And I don't know where this is coming from, where, you know, it's just like, if, if someone's an expert, so what? I read on the internet that this is so. Well, this comes from people wanting to simply uh, validate uh, a pre-existing perspective that they have. And part of that is the kind of contempt that they have for knowledge itself. And part of it is based on the idea that uh, 
they want to stay within their own silo and they would rather uh, trust someone with no experience, no expertise. I mean, look at the whole idea about the number of people who started drinking bleach, uh, the number of people who were um, ingesting hydroxychloroquine uh, based on something that the President of the United States was doing, um, despite the fact that there is no shortage of, of research uh, that shows that not only are these uh, ineffective, uh, but in fact, they are much more harmful than any possible benefit they might even have. So this is where we find ourselves today, that, uh, you know, in the pre-modern era, the relationship to truth or the ultimate truth uh, was usually a function of religion and it was a function of belief. Uh, no one could necessarily prove something because they didn't have the technological know-how or the scientific method, but they believed it, and they believed in the existence of an absolute truth. During the so-called modern era, we moved then to our relationship to the truth was what we can prove. Uh, so it was uh, scienter, it was, it was a scientific method, which meant that belief no longer had as much validity if you could actually prove, for example, that uh, the sun uh, uh, was not uh, rotating around the earth, but the earth was rotating around the sun. Uh, we come to the postmodern era um, a few decades ago, where the relationship with the truth is there is no single absolute truth. Uh, there's multiplicities of truth. Uh, uh, things are relative. This was uh, really a function of two things. One was Einstein's theory of relativity, the whole notion of seeing things outside the realm of absolutes. And the other was that the world was coming into its post-colonial period. So that was, that was able to give agency to people of color and people who were from the developing world to say that maybe their narrative uh, was one that should not be so easily dismissed or one that should not be so uh, easily uh, impugned. Uh, with a sense of superiority from, uh, from the West. And now we've entered, I would say, a post-truth period where it's not about an absolute truth. It's not about the multiplicity of truths. It's that truth just doesn't matter. And that is, I think, something that is uh, very dangerous because, again, we don't know uh, whether we've reached a bottom yet. And if we have, then what are the mechanisms to come out of it? And what will then be our relationship to truth moving forward from there. Very true, very true. And, you know, it, it is, it's, it's, it's almost madness, but I think this is kind of like, you hate to acquiesce and say these are the times we live in. So this is why I think, you know, it's really important to have these reassessments and be able to, to be able to come up with, you know, solutions. And um, that kind of leads into a question that I always like to pose, like, especially about, you know, looking at how so many gaps in our system have been exposed due to, you know, just the, the nature of the pandemic. And, you know, there were so many problems with our unemployment system. And, you know, we don't have, you know, mandated um, paid sick leave. And, you know, there, there are so many issues with healthcare and so many things that, you know, seemed fringe and seemed, you know, impossible, like universal basic income are now kind of, you know, the things that we're doing, but we don't necessarily, we don't have the answers and it isn't necessarily done, being done the, the best way because this of the decentralization of government and like the way that, you know, uh, the states are going to handle it and the federal government is going to do this, but not that. And so, you know, what historically went wrong? Because in the past, it seems that there was a way that people were taken care of. Um, and even though in the past we may have had our, our issues with, you know, just a myriad of issues concerning, you know, civil rights and rights of women. Um, but at the same time, there was, I knew that one generation of Americans were, were, were going to be doing better than the next generation. And I think, you know, of course, because of deindustrialization, we've, you know, gotten away from that. But how do we begin to even repair something that was for 40 years already broken? Well, we have to take a look at America on its timeline. And America had a meteoric rise when it came to uh, its position on, on the world stage. 
uh, it was uh, an accidental imperialist, if you will, uh, a, a country that really was not for uh, at least the first century of its inception, uh, having an appetite for a kind of global domination. That was, uh, in fact, if anything, we were rejectionists of it, uh, rejecting uh, and, and splitting from a colonial power like Great Britain. Uh, we left that to the British, we left that to the French, we left that to the Spanish and, uh, and the Dutch and, uh, and whomever else uh, to handle those, uh, those things. We were focusing on ourselves, we were looking at maintaining a certain level of buoyancy, we had the luxury of uh, two oceans to insulate us in many ways, and then the Spanish-American War comes about and uh, we sort of fall backwards into uh, acquiring colonial territories in the Caribbean and in the Philippines, uh, for example. But it also then creates a tremendous opportunity for many of our industrialists who were now saying, hey, we can go ahead and compete uh, and we can compete on a, on a world stage. We have something to offer, whether it is steel, whether it is oil, or whether it is the services to go ahead and, uh, and explore for them and to develop them. And so we see then uh, the United States turning into a different direction. Woodrow Wilson, of course, shows up at the, palace, uh, the Paris Peace Conference uh, with uh, the whole internationalist view of the 14 points. Part of it sounded, of course, very magnanimous, but part of it was also to place a check and balance on colonial rule. When he was talking about self-determination, that was going to come at the expense of the British Empire and, and some of the rest despite the fact that back home he was an inveterate segregationist and somehow or the other he was able to reconcile that uh, contradiction. Uh, after World War II, it, uh, th that, that boat has, had sailed. The United States was an internationalist and quite frankly really enjoyed that role. But you're right, around that time we have also the New Deal. We have the ability to go ahead and provide safety nets for uh, our people uh, for the ones who are the true driving force of the economy and what made the United States uh, the kind of country that it was. Uh, having the public works projects, having uh, social security and all. We then uh, took these for granted as being institutions that would be untouchable uh, because they worked. And because even if, they, uh, if people themselves didn't see much uh, relevance for them in their own lives, at least they should have had the gratitude that, but for these programs, uh, their parents were able to maintain uh, a certain buoyancy, or their grandparents were. And unfortunately, we've moved now several generations from that, uh, the period of the Great Depression, and um, uh, 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 become ungrateful about that. Mm -hmm. And then the neoliberalist uh, 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 view comes in in the late 70s, when there was a fatigue for uh, labor unions, uh, their value, their relevance, and notice that these coincide with, as you said, deindustrialization and uh, the, the bottom falling out of uh, the manufacturing base. And so in many ways, these serve as kind of a catalyst with each other. Uh, the neoliberal policies help to accelerate deindustrialization and demanufacturing, and the fact that there is deindustrialization then causes neoliberal uh, policies to gain more uh, resonance uh, and, and more appeal. Uh, that became a terrible vicious cycle moving forward, and now we see that uh, uh, no one seems to really question neoliberalism except at the risk of being branded a socialist or uh, some other aspersion being cast on them. But as you said, uh, all of those fault lines are now coming into uh, as much visibility as uh, when the spring thaw happens and you see all the potholes in the road. Uh, I, I, I can't think of a more apt metaphor uh, because uh, uh, the potholes then expose uh, the poor planning and uh, investment in infrastructure that is so critical. I was watching a documentary about China and how uh, within the last uh, 40 years, uh, cities that had populations of 300,000 now have 12 million, uh, like Shenzhen uh, across the border from Hong Kong and uh, skyscrapers, uh, public transport, electric buses, 
Uh, and this is just one of several megacities that, uh, that China has developed. It seems as though they blink their eyes and all of a sudden a high-speed railway system is, uh, is created. There was that esprit de corps in the United States in the, mi uh, in the middle of the 19th century moving onwards. Uh, that is how the railroads connected the United States. That's how you had people like Carnegie and Rockefeller. And yes, they, of course, then went on to become robber barons. But at least they had, uh, there was an atmosphere uh, by which the United States could grow uh, and still hold on to some sense of its ethos uh, mm -hmm. to take care of particularly those who were, uh, who were destitute. Well, even and, like the robber barons, these captains of industry, you know, you have the Carnegie Foundation and you had exactly. all of these these things where they decided, okay, well, I, I spent a lot of money getting rich, or I spent a lot of my time getting money and be, becoming rich, but now I'd like for there to be museums that everyone can benefit from. I'd like, you know, to invest in libraries, and it's almost like this, this, there was a community benefits agreements before, before there was this move now in the 21st century to, to have more community benefits, um, and this is just something that people thought, okay, well, I have a lot of money. Why not leave some endowment for the arts or for something that will leave a legacy and it will be for everyone? Um, I think we've kind of gotten away from it. And um, when, when you brought up, you know, just sort of like um, neoliberalism and you, you kind of talked about like, well, people wanting to, um, you know, get away from like, I don't want to be, you know, labeled a socialist. But in, in some ways, you know, we, we, I think it's just semantics because if you take away, you know, calling someone a socialist, but it's like, do you believe in, you know, that, that people should have healthcare? Is healthcare something, if someone were sick and they couldn't afford it, should they still be taken care of? And most people would agree. And some of these things that, you know, if you take away the semantics of it, then, you know, people would be on board with just taking care of things because we're a wealthy industrialized nation and why not? Sure, but that's the, 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 the danger of reductive semantics. And, and again, we can go back to social media that if it doesn't fit into 140 characters or whatever it is on Twitter, it, it, it doesn't count. Uh, we have now uh, reduced entire peoples, and it's nothing new, uh, into these archetypes uh, the, uh, the, the young woman who uh, uh, called uh, the police um, uh, deceptively in Central Park uh, against uh, the bird-watching uh, gentleman. And uh, he, he had her dog not on a leash, and all he asked exactly. was, oh, can you put your dog on a leash? But, but the entire thing becomes that uh, it's collapsed into just simply calling her Karen. Uh, it's, it's, it's a far more complex exploration uh, to say that here is somebody who was asserting privilege on many different levels. Uh, she was a vice president uh, at, uh, at a major uh, financial house uh, at Franklin Templeton. Uh, she, uh, interestingly enough, uh, was uh, at least as well educated as uh, the person she was accusing. He, a Harvard grad, she, a uh, University of Chicago MBA grad. Uh, but the whole idea then of uh, uh, the presumptions that people make, the whataboutism that, uh, that occurs from that, uh, the fact that uh, people were actually sitting here wondering, oh, she must be a Trump supporter when actually she wasn't, which then shows that uh, it, uh, racism cannot simply be uh, relegated to one side of an equation or the other. This is one of the big problems that uh, uh, people oftentimes have when it comes to racism geographically in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, they see racism as being a southern phenomenon. When in the so, north it can be just as prevalent and in the south you don't have as many you know issues depending on you know so so the circumstances and I think this is also something that on the right and on the left, we need to, you know, just even speaking to Joe Biden's comments the other day, um, you know, y'all ain't black, then it, it's just, I think sometimes liberals, uh, like in Democrats in particular, tend to take that for granted that, okay, well, I can say this because this party isn't racist, but it's just like, no, no, there really has to be a reassessment. And there has to be, you know, just this, this conversation that happens where you're not just going to, it's not just a given. And 
that's something that it really, really, it, it has to happen more. Well, what you're talking about, bringing it back to COVID, is, is so essential. Uh, what I'm looking at right now is uh, how is COVID going to change us, uh, looking at that other side of the wormhole. And for me, what's the interesting inquiry is taking a look at terminology, because you're right, semantics is so important. How is COVID going to make us have to reassess how we perceive and relate to the word democracy, capitalism, pluralism, populism. Uh, I think it's fair to say that those countries that have populism as a dominant force right now, which perhaps uh, elected their current leadership, those interestingly enough seem to be faring the most poorly when it comes to both the response and uh, the trajectory with COVID. The four countries I can think of in that, in that regard are the United States, Brazil, uh, the UK, and India, all of whom um, have elected, uh, interesting enough, not only populist leaders, uh, but ones that are ethno-chauvinistic, ones that uh, traffic in divisiveness, and who have tried their main way of dealing with COVID isn't to try to solve the problem, but to exploit it exactly. for political gain. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that actually leads, leads to uh, one of my questions that is, you know, it seems that in a lot of ways, Europe in, in particularly, um, you know, you look at like some, a lot of Eastern European countries that, um, I'm sorry, not Eastern, Western European countries that have managed to, um, you know, just stem the tide. You look at South Korea, for example, um, they, you know, have gotten a lot right as far as, you know, just stopping the spread and, you know, people actually listening to the stay at home mandates and, you know, not really that much protest that comes with it. And also saving, you know, small businesses and stopping, you know, a lot of, um, you know, saving, coming in and kind of putting in place some systems that will prevent, you know, a company from having to let go of their employees and putting in a social safety net so that, you know, people didn't have to lay off and then their employees were provided for. So what is it that, you know, I think you kind of touched on it. It's, it's one, one element is the populism, but what else is it that, you know, it seems that the United States has the means to, as far as, you know, kind of stemming the tide of what the damage could have been economically, you know. Right. I, I mean, I, I think perhaps uh, one factor that has to be examined is, uh, is anthropology. Uh, when you're looking at South Korea, when you're looking at Japan, which is uh, getting set to reopen, uh, what is it, uh, fewer than a thousand deaths? in a country of 120 million. Exactly. Uh, and, and these are countries that are no strangers to uh, catastrophic numbers of losses. Uh, the Korean conflict in the 50s, uh, obviously World War II, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the bombing of Tokyo, just, just three. I mean, and of course there were far more than that. There is a collective identity that comes together in times of adversity and, uh, and shows its true metal, it shows its true character. Uh, because they see themselves as being plugged into a bigger collective. And it is the collective that, that needs to prevail. Uh, you know, the Japanese uh, had really perfected the corporate model that you stayed with one corporation for life. Mm -hmm. There was no free agency. There was no bounding from one place to the other. I remember there was a movie in um, the mid 80s called Gung Ho. I think it might have been one of Ron Howard's first movies, which is about a Japanese auto plant opening up in a small, uh, rather post industrial Pennsylvania town. And you saw the two different cultural um, uh, uh, modalities that were clashing. Uh, the American one of being more uh, sort of free, uh, libertarian, and then the more rigid. Uh, but effective Japanese model of, of productivity among their managers. Um, the movie, of course, is slightly simplistic. It uh, provides a kind of synthesis. The Japanese learn to relax. The Americans learn to be a little bit more disciplined and everyone can go home and, I guess, enjoy a beer, um, which is how the movie ends. Oh. Uh, in those places where it is uh, more part of the culture to be seen as an individual, 
as being in fact uh, emblematic of the national identity. Uh, it is at times like this that those are really then challenged. Uh, even though again, um, we've, we've had war, we've had uh, drafts and people stepped up and even those who didn't serve in a combat role did their part, whether it was accepting rationing uh, limiting uh, their consumption of certain things. I mean, you saw, of course, uh, as so many of us did, uh, the, the stampedes for toilet paper and uh, the kind of hoarding that existed as the, uh, the shutdowns were starting to occur around the country. That in and of itself was indicative of, of how uh, the American ethos, unfortunately, has become. And again, uh, I don't think one could uh, easily or readily go ahead and identify people who were putting entire uh, shopping carts full of toilet paper and going through checkout as saying they must be um, um, red and they must be blue. It seemed at that point, the one thing that really then combined or, or uh, 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 merged them and united them was the fact that, they're, that they were operating off some kind of an American identity marker that, uh, that they had to fulfill. Uh, in those countries at the same time that do have a certain level of collectivism, it is minorities within those countries which may suffer. And so we're seeing this happening in India, for example, where religious minorities are falling prey to the Hindutva extremism uh, that is being trafficked uh, and encouraged by, uh, uh, by Prime Minister Modi. Uh, in Great Britain, uh, you already had, of course, with Brexit, uh, the battle lines drawn as to those who were seeking to separate from the European Union. There was already a sense of nativism. There was already a sense of reclamation of British identity. Yeah, it even seems like there was a rise. I've read about like a rise in um, Islamophobia in the UK um, during this time. And then even prior to then, it, it's just, you know, it's something that... Um, and that's something that, you know, I know we had this discussion when I was your student, um, you know, just Muslim identity in the UK, but I think also revisiting it since Brexit is something that, um, you know, it actually made me wonder, you know, how, how, has, how has that changed? Um, and, you know, what is, what is that now, you know, with the UK and sort of populism and sort of just uh, yeah. Boris Johnson and, you know, the, 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 the identity there now. Right. So the so the so the so populism in in England is uh, or Great Britain is is very very strange, because uh, you would be shocked to to know that uh, there were a fair number of Muslims in Britain who voted in favor of Brexit. Uh, it seems as though it would be an issue that, uh, particularly uh, the fact that there was so much nativism uh, that was involved uh, in in the debate as being a dividing line. Uh, the Muslims who voted, they said, well, we don't care much for the Eastern Europeans coming in here. Uh, we had to struggle. Uh, we had to go ahead and uh, endure all of this racism, packy go home, etc., and all these slurs. They're kind of coming in, and because they're white, they can, uh, they can pass, and uh, uh, why should we go ahead and support them with the amount of tax money that we've paid into the system when it comes to the social welfare program? Uh, in essence, it was not unlike what we see in the United States in places like Florida with the Cuban American population. Mm -hmm. uh, they escape communism and uh, in many ways they become more Republican than Republicans uh, compared to any other Hispanic group, uh, which who by and large, according to most American surveys, tend to uh, vote uh, Democratic. So that, that idea of a transferred nativism into a population that also has suffered the slings and arrows of, uh, of that nativism and, and bigotry is, is just one of the many complexities of Brexit. But now they have Boris Johnson. And in many ways, there is some level of buyer's remorse. And it really uh, waits to be seen uh, as to whether he's going to be able to survive even uh, the confidence of his own political party. He uh, has to deal right now with his chief advisor, Dominic Cummings, who was discovered to have flouted uh, and defied 
the government's own policies to stay in place. Uh, he felt as though the rules did not apply to him. Well, even Boris Johnson thought the, the rules didn't apply to him at a certain point where they were uh, trying to, you know, uh, wait it out. And what was the term? Um, it was, um, you'll get herd immunity just yes. by the nature of, you know, how this happens. And then That's Boris right. Johnson has the coronavirus. And, and in the case of, and, and, and Johnson really had a rude awakening to that. Uh, like Johnson, there, um, uh, Trump had the same uh, uh, notion uh, of saying, this is a hoax, this is a fabrication, uh, they're out to get me, taking it personally. Uh, for Johnson, a little bit more nuanced, said, saying let's try herd immunity because Sweden is trying it. Sweden has now uh, got uh, similar infection rates to those countries which have uh, been uh, sheltering in place, which then disproves uh, the value of uh, and effectiveness of herd immunity. So it is a mixed bag mm -hmm. as to what's going on in, um, in, uh, in Great Britain. But again, because you have uh, this prime minister who came in on a wave of populism, uh, the choices that are now before the people are to actually have a moment of self-reflection, uh, some humility to accept that they made a mistake uh, and they can move forward or simply double down and, and be in defiance of that and say, no, we're just going to keep going and we're going to beat this into the ground. And that's one of the things that, again, is a fault line that we see here in the United States between those who voted for Trump but now are either embarrassed or are, are, are uh, disaffected uh, versus those who are looking to double down. If in each country, those who are looking to, for lack of better words, uh, have a redemptive moment, if they're given that kind of latitude without having to uh, be given or made to give more than a pound of flesh, uh, to use Shakespearean terms, then we can move towards some level of reconciliation. If we're still in that mode that we will not talk to anybody from that side, until they literally cut out their own spleen and give it to us as tribute. Uh, that doesn't bode well as a way to get out of uh, the status quo and even uh, the negative side of uh, populism. Well, that's definitely, you know, it, it gives a lot of perspective on like the way that the rest of the world is responding. Um, and you know, it just kind of, it made me think of, um, and, I, and with this, I'm actually going to close because I remember, um, it, you know, it just, it has to be a me, not we sort of mentality that we take. And I think we've actually, as a, as a, as a planet, done a good job of, you know, for the most part, people are rational and most, most people are going to think about this in a rational way of, you know, I'm going to just wear a mask or I'm going to stay at home and, you know, corporations shut down and schools shut down and people were thinking rationally. And, you know, even in the very beginning, you know, um, when we saw how serious it was, you know, Trump at least, you know, made a, you know, um, he, 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 he was willing to, you know, start having press conferences and willing to start talking about, you know, things on a daily basis and, you know, so cooperating and, you know, letting Dr. Fauci speak more than, you know, just him, you know, giving out his opinion. So I think there was some consensus in the very beginning and we were, you know, just very united. Um, and, you know, the mayor of Harper Woods, where um, I'm a council person, and um, he, he always likes to say during, at the end of every meeting, it's, it's we, not me, and we, we just have to be together. Um, that's a direct quote from Ken Pointer. He always says, quote him, <laughs> if I use his words, which I do all the time. Um, and, you know, it, it just really points to the fact that we, we have to, we have to come together. And I think in some ways it shows that we, we have been good humans. We have been, you know, people who can, are, can, we care about each other. Um, and that kind of made me, it, it, it made me think of something that I remember you, um, you were one of the lecturers for a youth program that Wayne State, um, the Center of Academic Excellence and National Security and Intelligence Studies had um, for, you know, like maybe tween age kids. And I remember there was a world history class that the kids had and um, I was auditing it. And, you know, just kind of as, as a, you know, a TA with the kids, um, and I remember I was, the, the lectures that I was getting as, 
your students um, in college was kind of the same caliber lecture that these kids were getting. And I was, um, I don't know if it was a jealousy or almost like this, these kids aren't going to get it. They're not going to really understand, you know, what, you know, Saeed Khan is talking about because this is, this is maybe above their level. So I even, you know, talked to you, I was saying that like, maybe, um, you know, I could, I could give them a glossary or maybe I should, you know, kind of give them supplements so that they'll understand, you know, everything in a, you know, world history class. Um, and they were, what, 12, 13. And I remember you said something that I'll never really forget. Um, it's, you know, if you talk down to people, how will, how will they ever be brought up to the levels that they should be? And so for, for us to kind of dumb down the lesson <laughs> for, for the kids, it's like, what level will they ever live up to beyond what we expect them to know or be capable of? And you said that, and I think it, it kind of, we have to make sure that we include everybody in a dis discussion about the fact that you, you are, this is, this is yours. You should be a part of civic engagement. This, and, and I do these series because I want everyone to feel that they have ownership in, you know, in a political discussion and that everybody's voice should be heard. And that's something that I feel like it was a life lesson that I learned from you fairly early on. And, and it's just like, everyone should feel empowered and everyone should feel that they have, you know, this, this ownership and, um, they have the ability to go out and impact change in their own way and to to continue to to want to raise up to levels because someone gives them an option and, and gives them kind of like here you are here's something because i'm not just going to count you out and, and and that's i think the most important thing is that no one wants to be dismissed somehow or the other over the last few weeks uh, a lot of people uh, with whom i went to high school uh, discovered me on Facebook, and I got all these friend requests from from people from my graduating class or a year or two uh, back and forth. And it's wonderful uh, to be back in touch with them. And at the same time, some of them post uh, some fairly uh, malignant uh, memes and posts uh, disparaging uh, uh, Governor Whitmer, uh, praising uh, the president, and of course, it, 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 takes, it, it takes a remembering of the fact that we used to hang out all the time. Uh, and I, I always, if there is a disagreement on something, uh, I, I, don't, I never have an issue if anyone has a disagreement over policy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the tone, and particularly when it creates personal attacks against uh, uh, people who are in really difficult positions like like the governor yeah. uh, and uh, the way that I always deal with them and say hey man you know what you and I we we lived through the recession of the early 80s mm -hmm. uh, we came together in this town called Lapeer and somehow or the other we made it work uh, and it was it was genuine it was sincere and to simply go ahead and make them think, oh, well, you know, I moved on, I moved out, I'm, I'm uh, you know, doing this, I'm in this part of the world or that part of the world. That's not what's going to bring people together. And in many ways, there is still that 17-year-old Lapeer West Panther in me, and I know that it's there in the other person and, and how to connect on that level. Look, you remembered something that I said years ago. Uh, which always, of course, humbles me. And in the same vein, that's how I feel about the students that were in that world history class, that it may not hit them at that point, mm -hmm. but there will be a point where they'll be like, hey, I've heard this somewhere before. They don't necessarily have to credit me. They don't have to remember even my name, uh, because you always hope that the ideas are bigger and last longer than you do. And if that is something that provides them a frame of reference or even a point of departure to a better understanding, then mission accomplished. That, that's a, that's and on that note, I, I really want to say, you know, thank you for, you know, being a guiding influence in my life fairly early on in, you know, just my academic career. Um, and thank you so much for coming on the show. And 
you know, this, this, I feel like this was a nice quick to politic. We, we, I had a few more questions, but I, you know, at this point, um, I think we, we had a really good discussion and some of the questions that came up organically from the originals. I just like, I think, you know, I just really, really love, you know, hearing your perspective and you. Well, let me know if you want to do a sequel. Um, yeah, part two. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, any, any, anytime. And, uh, and I'll say it, um, thank you for validating what I do. Uh, because you certainly took the knowledge and uh, and really did something wonderful with it. And 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 you know I don't know people people say like oh well you're doing so amazing things and I'm like I'm just getting started and I know there's still so much left to to learn. There's so many things I'd like to do for my community here on the east side and then continue to grow and seek higher office as well. But um, you know it's it's you you have to really start and you really have to know that you know you 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 really, you have something within you to be able to impact change. And it, it's, it may be small and incremental, but it's, it's, you just have to start. So, yeah. and I think that was something uh, like a very valuable lesson that I took away from Wayne State and from your lectures. So thank you once again for coming on. And um, just to let everybody know, I have been trying to get, um, for, for like, I have been trying to do like this whole um, quick to politics since last year in November. And, you know, Saeed, you were my first guest. I, I reached out to you and I just couldn't find a time that worked for me to actually come in person. So I'm actually glad that this ended up working where most of the people that I was, you know, I'm like, I really want to pick your brain on these issues. Um, it, it works better in Zoom. So, well, I mean, I, 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 I'm grateful for the irony that the pandemic brought us together quicker. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you all out there for watching. And I'm going to go ahead and end now with...